Coming up on this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society, an episode guaranteed to increase in value. It's dangerous to go alone, so the Nintendo Cartridge Society goes with you. Welcome to Nintendo Cartridge Society. My name is Patrick Ellers, and I am joined, as I am always joined, by my co-host, Mark Mitchell. Mark, how's it going? It's going great. Patrick, let me turn this around on you. How's it going for you? Oh, Mark, you know, the other day I stubbed my toe real bad. Oh, no. Uh, I tripped and uh, kind of caught myself with the, the front of my foot, um, and now my toe, my big toe, which is monstrously larger than the rest of my toes always. This isn't a, a function of me stubbing it. Um, is now bruised on the end of it. Not fun. Black and blue. I think I think the only bone I've ever broken. I, this has, is not a broken has bone. Been a toe. I'm telling myself it's not a broken <laughs> bone. <laughs> it may not be, but with with, <laughs> with 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 toes, I don't know that you'll ever know. Whoa. What was your broken? It's an, okay, we're gonna it get to other an, stuff, it, but I want to know about it this. It was another stub. But, yeah. Right. Like I like stub my toe, but then a. I, uh, for s- whatever reason, yeah, I, I just had in my head. I was like, "Oh, this is broken," because it was like so like bruised and yes. ugly. Yes, that I and it like hurt. Did you to go to the? Did bit. you go to the doctor? No. When was this? Not over a toe. This was like fifteen years ago. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's and that's sort of where I am too. Where I'm like, oh, it hurt a. It hurt a little bit when uh-huh. it happened, and now it's like still sensitive. Um, and it was happened on Thursday. It is currently Saturday now, so it's been a couple days. Um, and I I can walk on it, but like I when the the final part of your step where you're like pushing uh, on your yeah. toes, that that I don't like that. Well, I am not a medical doctor. Thank you. So so do you want to look at it? <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, yes, but only out of curiosity. Okay, very not good. to give medical advice. All right, we'll we'll do that after we're done recording. But uh, here's something you can do in the meantime you can borrow my copy of sonic forces for the nintendo switch all you gotta do is email us at uh, nintendo cartridge society at, at gmail.com, gmail.com and give us a mailing address so we can send you my copy of sonic forces for the nintendo switch you play it for as long as you want you send it back it doesn't cost you anything i pay for postage both ways it's the perfect borrowing it's a perfect program. borrowing program there may be a copy of untitled goose game in there that only makes the program more perfect patrick i just thought of something while you were saying that yeah and um tell me if i'm completely off base do you think that if you or I got amnesia, okay, that the key to unlocking our memories uh-huh. would end up being conking our toes together? <laughs> That's not what I was thinking, <laughs> but it could be true. Uh huh. Yeah. What is? What the, is it? Do you th- like mm. out of uh, you or I? So let's say in this in this scenario, right? You have amnesia, okay, and the key to unlocking it is that I would visit you. In the hospital. I'm in a rocking chair with like a shawl uh, on. You, you still have bandages that's around right, your that's head. That's right. And I'm like, Patrick, do you remember me? And you don't. No, I of course of course I don't. But I key up the magic words. Uh-huh. Nintendo Cartridge Society. And then there's a glimmer in my eye and I go, at, at gmail.com. gmail.com. <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably what does it. Although I don't actually know if it would work on me. I think that's the, <laughs> the cure for you because I tee up the, <laughs> the email address. You don't. Oh, okay. I don't know if it works in reverse. Interesting. Well, hopefully, God willing, we never have to find out. I mean, we did just do it where you said the first part and I said the at gmail.com in chorus with you. So I think it does work. I think it might. But if Let's, all else fails, we'll conquer our toes yeah. together. <laughs> Doesn't hurt to try. Doesn't hurt we to try. We don't know. Another thing you can do is you can leave us a five star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, you know, Patrick and I. We started this Discord, which we're going to be talking about in just, a, just second. a second. Just, you know, just, just but, a second. Uh, we love hearing from listeners. We love interacting with listeners. And leaving a five-star review not only helps us grow the show, helps people find it, but also we just love reading your reviews. It makes us very happy. Um, there so are yeah. only a couple things that we like reading. Uh, we like reading uh, Star Wars High Republic comics. Uh, we like reading your five-star reviews of this show. And that's the end of the that's list. That's pretty much it. Two things. So uh, you can, you know, continue to help us yes. grow the show and have things to enjoy reading. If you leave us a review on the U.S. Apple Podcast Store, we can see it. 
and we will give you a shout out on the show. Of course, if you leave us a review anywhere else, we still want to give you a shout out. All even though we, it's harder for us to do so. We can't necessarily tell who left us reviews elsewhere. So please hit us up on Twitter. Send us an email. Let us know. We'd love to give you a shout out. And the very last thing you can do is you can get on our Discord. This is the time where we're talking about it. Um, we're in there. We're talking about Nintendo stuff all the time. It's a delightful little community. If you would like to be part of that community, either email us, hit us up on Twitter. Let us know that you would like to be a part. We will invite you. Everyone who's in there uh, has received an invitation in the past, so everyone has been moderately vetted by you and I uh, to be a cool person who's chill and wants to talk to Nintendo stuff. And just uh, the the occasional reminder, if you have never used Discord before, yes. you know, like Patrick and I, we're Discord newbies too. We're all just figuring it out together. Um, it's fairly straightforward. So if you have any interest at all, come check us out. Yeah. And look, if you uh, spend a little time in there and you're like, oh, I, I understand what this is. I don't actually need this in my life. Uh, you never need to come back. That's fine. We won't even notice. Yeah, we won't know. Uh, although I would notice if some of our, our dear Discord users uh, were to disappear, like snapped away Thanos style, I would notice, Mark. It would break my little heart. Uh, all right, Mark, let's get into our discussion of special editions. From Premium Edition Games and NintendoFuse.com, Barry Carenza is here. Barry, how you doing? Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Yes, it's, it's good to have uh, a, an expert of sorts on uh, physical editions of games, right? Where it's, This is going to be a, a fun conversation. Um, we are talking about our favorite limited edition or collector's edition or special edition uh, game or hardware packages. Um, did uh, I, I, I'd like to know... Uh, Everyone sort of just like history with that kind of release. Is it something that you go after? Um, is it usually too rich for your blood? Uh, Barry, we can start with you. What What's your relationship to special editions of games? Uh, at first, you know, there were none. You know, it really weren't special editions for a long time. And when they started coming out, they were usually for the big AAA titles. And a lot of that, that stuff, you know like on third parties from, from other systems uh, that were non-Nintendo, uh, a lot of that stuff wound up getting cheap. Like, I didn't need a collector's edition, so I waited. Uh, and then there was this, like, renaissance, a slow renaissance, and I believe, I feel like it started with NIS America. And they're like, hey, we're doing a special version of one of our games. You know, I love niche JRPGs and, and Japanese games. Like, special version only on our website. And I was like, let me get this. You know, and a couple months later, here's a second one, and there, and then slowly other companies started doing it, like Idea Factory and and uh, Exceed, and and I was like, okay, well, I, I can keep this collection up. This isn't so bad. And then other companies started doing collector's editions, uh, limited runs, special reserve, the strictly limited, uh, uh, signature edition, and I got to the point when I took a look at one of my game rooms and I saw this stack literally a stack of boxes uh floor to ceiling and it was just filled yeah. with collector's editions and i'm you know my wife looked at it and said what are we going to do with these boxes i said i don't know they're just in the middle of the floor what are we doing with them and she's like are, are you able to display them i'm like i have no room you know there's just too many at this point there's too yeah. many too many coming out they're too big uh and had like this whole big like cleansing session where we opened them up we checked what they were going for because i i would buy just the collector's edition i didn't buy the regular and if the value of the regular was comparable to the collectors i would just open the collectors and say i'm gutting yeah, it yeah i'm sure. getting rid of it i don't need it uh, even though i'm a collector i just don't have room for it i'm not getting joy uh and if the value was significantly higher i would sell the collector's edition and buy a standard copy um for myself and this this was like so therapeutic i had boxes <laughs> upon boxes of recycling because i recycled all the outer boxes and everything i kept you know the, the art books and the soundtracks and you know a lot of the little doohickeys i didn't even care about i'm like why is this here um, the doohickeys are rough. They are. Uh, that's it's uh, it, you know art books. Yes, 
uh, and CDs, yes, or but not anymore. Like I feel like there there was a time where uh, CD soundtracks I, I was into, but now it's like, what do I even do with a CD? Like, I burn can I music. play a CD? <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> um, but yeah, the uh, the sort of just uh, extra stuff that comes along with these things um, ends up being such a weight that like outweighs the joy of having like the special collector version of the thing. Yeah. So now I'm at that point where if it's a game I love, a series mm-hmm. I love, I will go ahead and get the collector's edition. But a lot of times I'm not even keeping it sealed. Uh, for example, Metroid Dread had a collector's edition. I bought it. Yes. I opened it up. I played the game. I put that on the shelf. I took the art book and I, and, you know, and I put that you know on the, on the art book shelf. They, perfect. See you exactly. I, I, and, I got mine right here. <laughs> and, and I'm debating with the box because it is pretty. Do I want to keep it to display or just recycle it? Because I also got the posters from Club Nintendo with the same image and I have those framed on my wall. So it's like, what do I do? Um, but yeah, if it's a game like that, I will absolutely go for it. Um, Mark, what's your relationship to uh, special editions? Yeah, I feel like when special editions started becoming really popular, or at least I had the money to buy them, I, uh, at that point, was not really, like, collecting physical things. I went, personally, I went through the DVD era was when I collected, like, crazy and then when I was mo- uh, I was moving, you know, from like apartment to apartment, it was like I can't I can't do this anymore. So I went through my own cleansing where I just got rid of uh, everything and kind of went to the opposite extreme where I don't really collect physical stuff right now. So my fondest memories, although I have to say, like when I go over to Patrick to your house and I see you know your uh, Fire Emblem 30th anniversary, I see your Metroid Dread collector's edition. It's like ooh, like. Maybe there is space in my heart for these collector's editions. But for me, like uh, hardware, I love um, special edition hardware. And so there's a couple on my list that we'll be talking about a little bit later. My relationship to uh, special editions is uh, I really, I have to give myself a, uh, like a hard line of like, not unless you really want it. You know what I mean? Um, I had a uh, i had like the thing with amiibo where i just like wanted to get ev- basically ev- not not all but like most amiibo amiibos i ended up trying to collect at, at one point or another um and like that sort of became the thing for me of like that can be my uh like physical tchotchke uh that can fill that hole right um uh and so i i do have a handful of um special edition or limited edition things but i would you know, it's 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 really down to like below ten at this point. We have prepared. We have each uh, come in with a, a couple of our our favorite uh, limited edition, special edition, collector's edition uh, hardware or software that we want to talk about. Mark, you want to hop in with yours? Yeah, I can go first. So the first one that on my list is uh, some of these. I well, actually, the majority of these I don't actually own, but this one I did own and it's the game boy advance sp classic nes limited edition so it was a game boy advance sp which was the redesign of the game boy advance instead of the game the original game boy advance was the the like clear purple uh i don't even know what you how would you would describe it but it was just like a slab and then the had no backlight so the screen was really difficult to see, and the Game Boy Advance SP came out a couple of years later, and it was a clamshell design. Looking at it now, it's kind of remarkable how like small and weird it is. It's just a like yeah. a little square, this little flat, really kind of like fat square. Um, but the the NES limited edition was perfectly timed for the Game Boy Advance because this was the first time that Nintendo was releasing straight up NES games on, you know, a Game Boy hardware. So you could play through the NES version of Super Mario Brothers. Uh, I'm blanking on the other ones that they had, but like a bunch of the black box NES games were available for the Game Boy Advance and the NES class or the classic NES limited edition. It's like two tone gray, but when you open it up, the inside looks like an NES controller. And it was the perfect like 
time, that perfect like hit of nostalgia for me. I really loved it. Also, I was looking up unboxing videos of it the other day, and I had forgotten. Mm-hmm. I, I can't remember what the U.S. box was like, but the European box was so cool. It's like the original Super Mario Brothers themed packaging where the, the majority of it is that like sky blue from the background of 1-1 one, one with the clouds and um, some of the enemies and Mario on it. Like it was, it's still just a cool looking piece of kit. Yeah, that's, that, that's so cool. I wonder, uh, did they didn't do like a, a Famicom version of that for Japan, did they? I think they did. They did? That's cool. Okay. I like those. I like those Famicom colors too. Well, we also got the Famicom color Game Boy Micro here. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I never owned a Game Boy Micro. Did either of you? Yeah. Later Which one on. did you own, Barry? I had just the regular ones, the first ones with the face plates. And it was really weird. It was. It's. It's much smaller than you realize. Like it's. It, it does cramp your hands, but it, it's a novelty. Yeah. Uh, all right, uh, Barry, you want to give us uh, sure. y- your first? Um, well, my first is the Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition, the limited edition that came out in Europe. Because North America, we got a collector's edition that contained an art book, and that was it. And I was like, all right, that's great, but come on, Nintendo of America. But Europe <laughs> got a bigger box, beautiful artwork on the box. It came with a vinyl soundtrack. It came with a steel book, a beautiful steel book, the same art book, and the game case, and and a poster as well, big poster uh, for future connected uh, storyline. And it just Xenoblade is a special series to me. It's just one of those truly amazing titles. And when I saw this, I said I have to go for it because Nintendo of Europe likes to give steel books where Nintendo of America doesn't. And, yes. and it's just, I'm not a vinyl collector. It's one of two vinyls I have in my set, but I'm like, I love Xenoblade <laughs> music. I got to keep it. I wish it was a CD, but it, it's just one of those, they knew the game was special. They mm-hmm. definitely embraced it over there more than it, they do here where we had to do Operation Rainfall to even get the game. Uh, and I love it. I love that they gave it the treatment they deserved, the, the big box, beautiful art treatment. Yeah, that's awesome. Um my first pick uh, is it's one that I uh, honestly don't have any proof actually exists. Um, but uh, do you do both of you recall a couple years ago um, when Nintendo was launching uh, Labo and Labo Garage that they uh, released or it, they created a cardboard edition of the Nintendo Switch uh, and that was a prize for people who came in first place in various regions for uh, like a Labo create your own musical instrument, create your own game experience contest. Yep, um, I remember that. And <laughs> it, it's, I, I, I went out looking to see if there were like any videos of these things in the wild or like if any, if there were any like stories written later about um, people who actually received these things. And I couldn't find any evidence that there actually was uh, Nintendo Switch cardboard editions in the wild. I saw people unboxing the cardboard Joy Cons, so we can be reasonably well assured that the cardboard Joy Cons exist. Um, and in the the two unboxing videos that I watched, um, they uh, they both call out the sort of like texture of the Joy Cons themselves. Um, that it feels different. That it almost has a little bit of a, a cardboard feel to it. And on like the rails of the Joy-Con, it has it looks like it's that like corrugated like cardboard sort of texture. Um, but this is uh, like such a wild thing for Nintendo to have designed Joy Cons and a uh, a whole system like the dock and like the the back of the system has like the Labo logo on it and it's all that brown cardboard um, or it's not actually cardboard but it looks like cardboard um, for uh, just winners of of, of a contest. Okay, so that that's what I was going to ask. It's not actually cardboard. It just has the right uh, texture of cardboard. It has the tactile feel of cardboard without actually being cardboard. The sensation of cardboard that we all crave. That's right. <laughs> um, but yeah, if if anyone has if anyone has any evidence of this thing actually existing uh, in the real world, I don't think there is any at this point. Um, I've not seen any like any impressions with it just just the joy cons wait remind me were the joy cons were they sold separately or were those like sent out promotionally or to other winners 
No, so it, yeah, it was, it was like runners up in the uh, in, in the competition. So got the, it. the winners got got the the full system with the the dock and the system itself uh, having the cardboard the cardboard look to it, um, and the Joy Cons, and then the runners up just got the the cardboard Joy Con, um, which I can be reasonably well assured exists. Two different videos of people unboxing them, so <laughs> that's probably real. But the the Switch itself, uh, I guess I, it's possible we'll never know. Okay, yeah, mine. Seen anyone with the switch? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, my next pick are this is um, it's hardware of a sort. So my picks are the Pika Bug VW Beetles and the uh, Lugia PT Cruiser. How do you say that? I'm not a Pokemon person. Is it Lugia? Or Lugia? Lugia. Lugia. Yeah. There we go. That just felt so crass. I was like, it can't possibly be Lugia. But I. But it so, might be. I suppose it is. Um. So yeah. So in nine, starting in 1998, Nintendo uh, of America created ten VW Beetles that were yellow and themed as Pikachu. Um. And what? five Lugia PT Cruiser starting in the year 2000 and going on promotional tours to promote various nintendo games and so i recall seeing a yellow pikachu vw beetle in the city that i grew up in but i'm fairly confident that it was not one of these official one of these like 10 official pika bugs i think it was just somebody who is a huge enthusiast who right. like customized the car themselves which um to me is pretty that's pretty amazing i think because I generally, like, when I'm driving in a car, I don't really want to be noticed. But this person clearly, that person, like, clearly very much wanted to be noticed. Um, but I... I, I mean, I think it's... I, I think it's different when it's a thing that, like, you want to be noticed. Like, if, if you're a big Pokemon fan and you want other people to see that, like, I think that... I think that... Ma- like, there's there's a, a Jeep in my neighborhood that uh, is the Jurassic Park Jeep. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um. And, you know, either that's, like, a, an official piece of merchandise or someone customized their own Jeep. And, like, I would I would drive that around. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah, and if you're talking about, like, the year 2000, kind of the uh, initial uh, – cresting the initial wave of hype for Pokemon. Actually, driving, like, a, maybe, I, maybe I was just jealous because driving a Pikachu <laughs> BW Beetle, like, uh, that would actually be pretty cool. That is hardware of a sort, Mark. You're right. <laughs> not not the hardware I was thinking of. Uh, Barry, what's your next one? <laughs> yeah, how do I follow that? Um, <laughs> I'll go with a piece of hardware uh, that I just find really cool. Uh, in Ninten- in Japan, Nintendo of Japan did a partnership with McDonald's where they released a special edition Nintendo DS uh, for McDonald's. It was black matted with the golden arches in black on the cover and these were only sent to mcdonald's of japan along with two different carts that were training programs for employees to learn how to make the different you know mcdonald's sandwiches and the fries and breakfasts and all that and do tests and keep track of their score and these were never sold in stores these were only you know given to to these mcdonald's in japan uh and you know they obviously don't use them anymore uh so there's very few of these that have survived the you know i guess the purge of how many were thrown out but i just think it's such a cool story and so cool to see these systems with the games that's incredible so the 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 software was just that was just like training programs for it, mcdonald's it was stuff? training programs it had like quizzes to quiz you on it had videos like the the videos you would see you know when you would go to the back room and here's how to learn different things you would get those right. kind of videos but compressed onto a ds screen to show it to you which is even funnier and then you would actually play little mini games where you would have to all right pull out this tray to get the burger and toast the buns and wrap it up and like put the ketchup on it and do all that and you were timed and and you were graded on how well you did, and you could practice to get better. And that worked for everything, the fry cooker and the, the hash browns and everything uh, that you were doing. Even even you know, stuff that we never got here. There's like a teriyaki burger, the teriyaki McDouble or something that we never got in America, but you could learn how to make it with these carts. 
Um, that I always forget that the DS had that like period where they were like trying to integrate it into other real world experiences. Like there's uh, like tours of museums and stuff that, that you was could the run 3DS. on 3DS. Oh, what was that on 3DS? That okay. was with the Louvre and 3DS. Yeah. Man, it'd be so cool to have a a Golden Arches uh, DS to just like just play games on. That's so yeah. that's so cool. Well, the DS is region free. Yeah. Oh know. yeah, yeah. I uh this. I don't have any on my list, but the Nintendo DS is the Nintendo system that I have bought the most of, and they had, like, a lot of fun limited edition Nintendo DSs. I got the um, the golden Nintendo DS, or w- was it a Nintendo DSi? I can't remember right now, but they uh, came out with Phantom Hourglass. And yes. mm. yeah, it was just like uh, with the DS. I think even that was more, a DS Lite. A DS Lite, yeah, for sh- it, you're right, it was. And I feel like with the DS, more than any other system that I was aware of, uh, Nintendo just kind of went crazy with hardware. Like there were so many different variations in a way that we usually don't get in America. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Uh, all right, so my next uh, special edition is uh, one that I always wanted, um, but missed the boat on the like pre-order window, and then it immediately skyrocketed to uh, ridiculous value. I'm referring to the Fire Emblem Fates Collector's Edition, um, which uh, had the all three versions of the game on on one cart, so that you know Fire Emblem Fates uh, Birthright, Conquest, and the other one Re- Revelations. Revelations. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that was uh, w- at the time that it was released. That was the only way to get Revelations. They would later like uh, add that as uh, down uh, another like downloadable uh, scenario in the game. Um, but you know, it also came with a, a, a cool little pouch to put your your 3DS in uh, and a, a big old art book. Um, and just the box for it is so like grand and epic and heroic with just like all these characters on on the cover of it. Um, yeah, it's just so cool looking. Um, uh, but now you can't like it goes for a uh, us uh, 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 an even thousand uh, dollars on all like resale markets now. Uh, originally sold for eighty. So uh, yeah, it's it's something that I'm so envious of, and ev- every time I see it, I'm like, oh God, I wish, I wish. <laughs> this is one of those cases where there's actually a difference on the cart where there's you know DLC or or actually in this case an entire game where. You can only yeah. get it that way, and now with the 3DS eShop closing, that will soon be the only way to play an entire Fire Emblem game, which is really a travesty, and you know it just shows that they really should have produced more copies of this. Yeah, totally. Well, I, I mean, if nothing else, more copies of that one cart that had yeah. all three versions of the game on it. Yeah, like a standalone version of it or something. Like, yeah. If you don't want the extra stuff, here's the cart with the, the gaze for 80 bucks or whatever, 70 bucks. Uh, Mark? All right. My next pick is another one that I've never owned. And I I think maybe, you know, like three people have owned this in the entirety of its history. And I was just recently made aware of it because it is back in the news. And I'm, of course, talking about the golden Wii that was created for the Queen of England <laughs> by uh, THQ. So the story yes. behind this is that a... Uh, British tabloid published during the height of the Wii era, a British tabloid published an article saying that the Queen of England liked Wii Sports bowling. And uh, THQ was promoting kind of like a Wii Sports knockoff. There were quite a few of those for during the Wii era called Big Family Games. And to capitalize on it, they created a 24 karat gold encased Wii plus Wiimote plus um, the analog, the nunchuck, the Wii nunchuck, nunchuck. nunchuck, and sent it to her, not realizing that the palace, like, refuses all gifts. And so they technically checked the box because they mailed it to her, but it was returned and just apparently sitting in the THQ offices for a really long time. And then when THQ shut down, eventually got picked up by... Um, some collectors and i think the person who owns it now lives in like the netherlands and they have the wii and the joy or uh, the wiimote but not the nunchuck 
I think the nunchuck is missing. Whoa. Damn. How how much is a gold nunchuck worth? Because it it's real gold, right? Yeah. <laughs> Presumably, yeah. Yes. But I guess I guess maybe like a really like uh that's this is why I was asking you about cardboard earlier because I'm assuming it's like a really mm. thin, you know, encasing of gold. And so I just wasn't sure if the cardboard switch was a really thin, you know, casing of cardboard. Sure, it's it's cardboard leaf that you can uh, put on ice cream to sell at fancy restaurants. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, wow, what what a pick! What what would be the what game would you play on on a gold Wii? I think it would be big family games. I think you would have to, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's right. You have to get the complete experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, what a what a what a system to play a Zelda game on, though. Like oh, to play Twilight Princess on it, it'd be perfect. Yeah. Yeah, Twilight or Skyward, or um, mm -hmm. yeah, Skyward Sword would be good for there. Do we think that the gold Wii remote has the Motion Plus in it or not? I think uh, it depends. I was gonna say it depends <laughs> when it came out. Yeah. I I think it doesn't. I think it's just a traditional Wii remote. So then would you put a regular Wii Motion Plus into the bottom of a Wii remote? You couldn't. That's you a crime. You couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. Not I'd, that I'd, I'd one. You'd have to get it. You'd also have to get the Wii Motion Plus accessory gold plated as well. Custom job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great pick, Mark. <laughs> Barry? All right. Um, for my next one, it's going to be a little bit... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, self plug, but I have to do it because it's so great. Is is uh, our premium edition deluxe versions of Robot Name Fight and uh, Pigeon Dev Games Collection Tide. Uh, both of these editions uh, are labors of love with beautiful artwork on the outer slipcase. They've got Neo Geo cases with art to house everything, Ooh. retro boxes inside with steel books, the games with the, the manuals and the slipcases, and and the whole nine yards soundtracks and then to top it all off the premium guide which um uh, they're they're like silver gilded they're like 200 to 300 pages full guides for each of the games like yesteryear ready to go for you uh just well crafted uh, everyone that sees them falls in love with them and i'm one of those people that once i saw the vision come to reality I was like, oh my god, this is incredible. So it is, you know, while it, while it is a, you know, obviously I'm attached to it, it's still, even if I wasn't, it would be picked here as one of the, the best collector's editions. That, that's huge that they, uh, what, what uh, where does the idea to include a guide with, with the games, where, where does that originate? Or can you trace that back to? That comes from one, uh, you know, one of our, one of our founders, uh, Jeff, who writes books and has done it for so long, uh, wanting to incorporate that. And all of us growing up in the era when you got the strategy guides and you sat there on the, the, the carpeted floor, you know, with the controller, you know, you were close to the TV because it was corded and you had the guide and you were just like, oh, what's where yeah. we go in here? And you're flipping through and trying to find secrets and use the maps. And, uh, you know, it was it was a different time of gaming and it was a you know, it's a special time for all of us. So we wanted to bring that back because you don't really see that anymore, especially in the days of the internet. Yeah. Um, it, it all, that kind of thing always makes me think of uh, my experience with the original Earthbound because that uh, also came packaged yeah. with that book. Um, but, you know, that was also just like the era when, because, you know, I, I was a Nintendo Power subscriber. So, like, I had the... Um, they had issues that were just strategy guides. Mm -hmm. uh, so like that Super Mario Brothers 3 one, I remember I <laughs> tore through that thing. Like it, it was physically destroyed. I read it so much. Um, the Final Fantasy one, yep. um, uh, you know, just like well creased, well read uh, next to my NES. That's actually something we took inspiration from. And the cover for the robot named Fight one is modeled 100% after the Nintendo Power strategy guide. The the logo, the colors, yeah. the the format it's exactly modeled after that yeah that sounds so cool like you said like uh having manuals like having those like physical books was such a big part of the gaming experience but i think also just like having it be a book that you can use to play the game makes it different than an art book i like art books too yeah. um but when there's something where like you are encouraged to engage with it while you are engaging with the game um just makes it feel like it's more 
a more of a related product instead of just like an, an also ran, you know? Exactly. And well, actually with, with robot, one of the cool things is there's not a lot of information online, even about the game and the wikis are, aren't correct. So we actually work <laughs> with the creator to make sure all the information is correct uh, in there. And that's like the full records for that game. And uh, that is an, such a fun, you know, Metroidvania that you'll never see the same thing twice. It's like 4 billion different <laughs> combinations of oh levels <laughs> and, and all these different power ups. So, you know, this with no record of, of a lot of that stuff, it's good to finally get that out there. Um, that's a great pick here. Let me, let me do a, a bad one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I actually know this, I, I, this is, this is not a bad one. I, I like this one. Um, but there was a, a brief period when the original Super Mario Maker came out that they were releasing a Wii U Super Mario Maker bundle, um, which, you know, I, I like Super Mario Maker 2 okay, uh, but I feel like it was missing some of the uh, magic that made the original Super Mario Maker um, so feel like this sort of endless sandbox of creativity, right? Um, and a lot of that is just the way that you built levels on the wii u gamepad um it's look they made some like great workarounds for it on the switch um but the wii u it was it was intuitive um and so like packaging that game and the uh wii u together along with like the little like inspiration art book um where it's got uh these like little layouts uh, on on graph paper of uh like a level levels from the uh original games um, it's just so cool and so like I don't know there there there's the element of inspiration that I feel like is missing from Super Mario Maker Two, um, and the original Super Mario Maker just did such a nice job of offer offering inspiration in addition to giving you all the tools and uh, that uh, I, I believe it, it may not have been um, in, in the states but uh, in Australia and in Europe um, they came with the uh, 8-bit Mario uh, Amiibo, um, which is also a cool little, um, cool little thing to use with, with that with that game. Are you talking the system bundle or the standalone uh, game? Oh boy, uh, I'm gonna say the system bundle. Ooh, yeah. See, the standalone also came with that art book, but that system bundle mm -hmm. was a, was a nightmare. I do agree with How you so? on bad pick because in the states, that was the only way to get that Amiibo. Because it was oh, two yes. different eight bits, and that was the mm -hmm. only way. And Amiibo hunters were like, "We have to buy a whole Wii U just to get that <laughs> Amiibo." Like it was just terribly done. People were buying it, opening it up, changing it for the other one, and returning them because they're like, right. "Oh, wow. yes, I remember you know, that." It, it was it was such a misstep that they did eventually release it standalone, and they they did it as a Black Friday thing at Walmart only, which again <laughs> wasn't really helping things. But yeah, I remember when that bundle came out, and I was pissed because I'm like, "How am I going to get yeah. this amiibo? Like, I'm not buying a whole Wii U just for it." <laughs> uh, yeah, the, I mean, oh, they they were they were wild with amiibo at that point. Yeah, I was in the middle of the craze, and they knew exactly what they were doing. What they were doing right. is they had a bunch of Wii U's unsold, and they figured, how could we get people to buy it? Let's throw something there that's going to make people want to buy it, and it only made people pissed off. <laughs> Uh, Mark, do you have another one? I do. Okay, so this is my final pick, and um, I when I was researching special editions, it's look, it's only tangentially related to Nintendo because eventually Resident Evil Six showed up on the Nintendo Switch, but there's a there was a Resident Evil Six Premium Edition in Japan, and it's kind of giving it away, but it's called the Leather Jacket Edition in Europe. And for okay. $1,300 or the equivalent of yen in Japan and 900 pounds, you could get a special edition of Resident Evil 6 that included a copy of the game, four little, like, what they call tablet cases, but are little, like, containers, one uh, specific to each character that is a replica of, like, where healing items are found in the game, and three DLC maps for Mercenaries mode, some stickers, but... Best of all, you could get a actual leather replica of Leon's jacket from the game. And it is, I have no idea, it can't possibly be one size fits all. So I have no idea how <laughs> you would like determine whether this jacket like fits you correctly or not. But I love it so much because it is almost identical 
to a jacket I got from like Forever Twenty One for like twenty bucks during that yeah. era. But I love these. Um, I I love these special editions that come with something like truly a little bit crazy, like something that only only for super fans is uh who this is made for and i uh really like leon's leather jacket and i love that it was included uh, in this special edition do you know if it had any like uh visible resident evil branding on it yes. or was it just the jacket well oh. so it didn't have res it didn't have resident evil branding what it did have was uh i'm trying to remember so it had a the dso the division of security operations logo um but i think th and leon's name tag inside of it so i think other than that i don't think there was any like strong resident evil branding so you could just get away with wearing it as like a cool leather jacket yeah that's so that that is a cool jacket but i feel like the coolest jacket is claire's jacket from resident evil 2 right i mean hands that down, red one sure. with like the dragon thing on the back of it like it doesn't get much cooler than that. Yeah, agreed. Barry, you got All another one? Right. Yeah, I got another one. Um, so another European game because, uh, again, Nintendo of America just sucks. Um, and that's the Link's Awakening Collector's Edition uh, or Limited Edition that they put out for the Switch in Europe. Uh, where the box itself is this beautiful artwork of Colent Island. Just gorgeous. Comes with a hardcover art book which we we got an edition here with this i think it was a soft cover there it's the same art book and hard cover but really what sets us apart is that they also included a steel book and one of my favorite steel books because mm -hmm. it's the one that looks like a original game boy playing the original Link's awakening and yes. it's just Link's awakening is my favorite zelda game and it's so special to me and i originally played it on the game boy so to see that was like Oh, it was gorgeous, and and that's one of those boxes I did not break down because I actually use it as display because the artwork for Cole and Island is just so gorgeous. Uh, so again, I had to import it because Nintendo of America is like, no, you don't need steel books, you don't need need beautiful boxes or anything like that. Uh, so yeah, it's just it's one of those things that just really resonate. I think it also came with a poster as well, Link's Awakening poster. Uh, just an awesome addition. Uh, I, I you describing it just now like it it, w it was the 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 Game Boy uh, steel box case that made me like oh yes I remember us talking about that when uh, it was announced but not coming here um, it's so that's so cool R remind me is it uh, is it playing on like a uh, an old school Game Boy or a, a Game Boy Color is it the oh DX it's, an, it's an original or? old school Game Boy awesome. with the original black like green and black yes. screen that you can see playing Link's Awakening. Uh, on the steelbook it's the title screen and the back of the steelbook also is like the back of the game boy so when you hold it it looks like you're holding a much skinnier uh, game boy than right. the original which because it was original was so fat but uh yeah it's just a gorgeous looking steelbook um that's a great that is a, a, a wonderful pick um my next pick is the super mario brothers game and watch uh in the so th this was not this is not one that uh, could be purchased. This was again uh, sort of a prize. Um, this is the Super Mario Brothers Game and Watch in the yellow uh, Disc Coon case. So Disc Coon being the sort of uh, uh, avatar for the Famicom um, disc drive, this little like yellow blocky creature. Um, and uh, so it was a a big case that a smaller version of the Super Mario Brothers Game and Watch. Um, was in and instead of being so the normal Super Mario Brothers game and watch is the widescreen version and it's like a it's blue um, and it just uh, it has a very different feeling to this like electric yellow one um, that is not widescreen presentation but the game is exactly the same um, and it's just such a like you know we we talked about game and watch uh, at the end of last year um and just sort of like went through uh, all, all all the game and watches and you know ev every now and then there's there's something in there that's uh just like knock you down beautiful and the simple like pop simplicity of this uh discoon case um is so cool um i want this thing i want it so bad <laughs> you said you went uh through all the game and watches that's Sounds well, well we talked we talked about all of them <laughs> yeah did 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 you also include the timeout games 
what are the timeout games? No. Oh. Um, oh. So, so in a lot of people don't even realize this. The they think the Game and Watch <clears throat> was the first here, and it really wasn't. Um, what happened was the Game and Watch came out in Japan, obviously, and Nintendo was at this time unsure about the American market, so they weren't sure how the Game and Watches would do, especially with the game crash, you know, Atari crashed the market mm-hmm. in 1983. So they were really unsure um, if they wanted to bring anything over. So they teamed up with a company called Mego Corporation, which I believe based out of New York. And they said, all right, you know, you can release some game and watches uh, as a test to see see how it does. So they had four of them. Uh, they renamed them uh, to different different names. And they were, they're a little smaller than the standard game and watches. And they were called timeout games and they were released pretty much only in the New York area, I think, to start with. And uh, just one run just to see how they did. And clearly they did well enough that Nintendo then brought over the Game & Watches, including those four with the, the their original names and, and size scale. And, you know, obviously the rest is history. And yeah. Mega Corporation and the Time Out Games was just kind of like swept under the rug, even though they're official <laughs> Nintendo products and, and only put out here in the States. Oh, that's so cool. Do you know what games those were, those four games were? Uh, I know. I, I, I have them upstairs. I know one of them was Ball, which yeah. uh, I think was Toss Up originally. Flagman, I think, was one of them. Uh, what were the other two? Because there were, there were. Yeah, but like fr- from that original set of like six? There was only four. There was only four released. It, it was That's just, very cool. It was just, you know, those are the only four they decided to go with. I don't know why though they picked those four. They figured these were the ones that would do well. Um, toss up was was ball t- instead of ball. It was toss up. Flagman, uh, fireman was one of them, uh, which mm-hmm. is the um, one where you know the people are jumping out. I forget what it's actually yeah. called. And you have the parachute, or you have to like hit them on the trampoline. They called it fireman. Uh, and I forget what the fourth one was. Oh, it's, uh, the exterminator was the fourth one, which is the, uh, one where the whack-a-mole kind of deal. Oh, vermin. Vermin. So instead of vermin, they called it the exterminator. Uh, and, uh, fire, I, I I believe, uh, uh, fireman is just called fire. fire. Yeah. So they, they changed them up. Barry, I'm, I'm curious, just in general, do you catalog your collection? Like, do you have, like, a, uh, um, do you just do it by memory, or do you keep, like, a a record of everything that you have? I learned very quickly to keep a record of everything, because I would go to, like, GameStops back when they used to do, like, the buy two, get one freeze, and they used to have, like, a lot of cheap games, or or we go to yard sales, and I would just buy, you know, games, and then I would come home and go, I already have this. (laughs) <laughs> oh, I have this. I have this. And I got tired of buying doubles, so I started cataloging uh, bits and pieces at a time because uh, it is a big process, but it, I recommend it to everybody um, because then at least you know what you have. I don't I don't have any more picks, but I am curious. You know, we've talked a little bit about, um, you know, Nintendo of Europe really killing it with these special editions where Nintendo of America, like, doesn't – a lot of times, like, doesn't bother. And I'm curious if people have any, like – uh, thoughts as to why that is the case because Nintendo because I feel like Nintendo of America is constantly getting cool special editions that never make it here uh, I would say that Nintendo of America as a whole at least the higher ups and, and no offense to Doug Bowser uh, but they're just a little out of touch or if they're if they're not out of touch then the rest of America is out of touch with the collectors um, because Nintendo of America has done some boneheaded moves versus Europe. Uh, obviously, Operation Rainfall was a big boneheaded move. It took forever for us to finally get those games. And now Xenoblade is selling millions of copies. Oh, who would have thought? Right. Maybe all the people begging you for the game. Um, th- they might have been onto something. Uh, but then you have what I call the infamous Wii U duo, where they took two small minor franchises that nobody cares about. They took Zelda and they took Mario Kart because nobody cares about those franchises. Decided to do a limited edition of two of the games and decided the entire continent of North America, not just the United States, but Canada and Mexico as well, 
there were maybe 500 people would even want these things. So they decided to launch them in New York City, only in New York City, 500 copies for the entire continent. Outrageous. And that would be enough for Mario Kart 8 and Hyrule <laughs> Warriors limited editions on the Wii U. And it's like, really? Did you think this through? And they went with it and they rolled with it. And now those editions are multiple thousands of dollars because there's so few of them out there. Those franchises are naturally collectible and big. And <laughs> I have to wonder why are you so stupid, Nintendo of America, with decisions like this? I mean, to do it once and say, oops, my bad, but to do it a second time, it's just like, really? <laughs> Did you not He's learn anything? Do we think that that's like based in the sort of, you know, blue sky, like everyone plays games, we're trying to make it not appear as though it's just like a, a specialty product, but like something that, you know, your grandparents own so they can play like Wii Sports on it. Uh, and then like just sort of taking away that, uh, that sort of like exclusivity or like the like sort of inherent gatekeeping that comes with um, collecting, like is, is that part of that mentality or... Because, like, what I, – I, I agree with you that, like, it is boneheaded, but it's, like, why? I think it's – Where's that come from? I think it's giving them – I think that's giving them too much – I mean, I, I think Nintendo of America and Nintendo in general is sometimes really inscrutable, like, why they do the things yeah. they do. Because, you know, I, I'm glad, Barry, that you reminded me about those – the Zelda and Mario Kart on uh, limited editions from the Wii U era because, you know, my, my guess was going to be that, oh, like – the switch is doing so well in the in you know north america that they don't feel the need to put in the extra effort to sell you know copies of these but it's but it can't be that because they were doing the same right. thing in the wii u era so i exactly. yeah I, I don't know it is i think it's just really it's really it it's kind of crazy to me because it feels like nintendo of america or sorry nintendo of europe and nintendo of japan like put in the effort on a lot of these products and Nintendo of America just kind of coasts for inexplicable reasons to me. They do. Nintendo of Japan gets games like Famicom Detective Club. They got that yes. physically. We got it digitally. Um, you know, let it come out there. The, the Wii U was in desperate need of sales. And you know Nintendo historically has only sold things for a loss once. And that was the 3DS after they had to cut the price originally. Outside of that, they've never sold anything at a loss so you know they're selling these at a profit if they just right. put up a pre-order let all stores do a pre-order for these collector's editions say you've got a week to do pre-orders and then cut it off and then ship them out they would have made a killing but they didn't they didn't they I, for yeah. some reason they didn't and if you do a pre-order mentality it's nintendo it would sell i mean some people quote the 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 death of mario march 31st thing uh, with you know the Mario 35 dying and the, mm -hmm. the physical of, of 3D All Stars and the digital of 3D All Stars being pulled, uh, and Fire Emblem was also pulled there. The physical aspect doesn't bother me because they gave you six months to get the game. They sold over eight million. The game is not rare. The pulling of the digital is just doesn't make asinine any sense. to me. I don't know yeah. why you would do it. I, I mean, they sold out of Earthbound digitally on the Wii U, so I guess anything's possible. Uh, <laughs> you know, Nintendo is just a weird company. And Nintendo of America, I think, is hands down the worst branch because they don't connect with their gamers. They don't try and do things. And when they do collector's editions, if you'll notice, you either get a steelbook or you get a game. You don't get both. That Metroid Dread, you only get a steelbook. Smash Brothers, only a steelbook. You know, all, all the Xenoblade Chronicles uh, 2 was only a steelbook. Uh, I don't know why, where Nintendo of Europe will give you both and Nintendo Japan gave you both. Uh, but but there might be light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, Xenoblade Chronicles 3 is, has a special edition, which is only available on their own site. Hasn't gone up yet, but it's only available there. So one of two things will happen. Either one, it's going to be so insanely limited print that they're going to yeah. sell out within an instant and go, oh, we only produced 500 for the entire continent. Or two, they're going to leave it open. They're going to sell a boatload and say, wow, we didn't have to pay retailers. We didn't have to pay you know, inventory fees. We print this to order. Let's do this with more releases. And if it goes well, maybe they'll say, hey, you know what? Famicom Detective Club, maybe that won't be a huge seller. But what if we do it on our site and see? You know, We have to print 5,000 of them. Let's see. We think we should sell 5,000. They'll probably sell 10, 50,000 of them, whatever. Uh, then they print to order. People are happy. They make money. So it's it's a win-win. 
But, yep. you know, unfortunately, they need to hit the wall before they start to, I don't know, be creative. But they keep... <laughs> They keep hitting that wall, though. I mean, like, <laughs> like h- hitting the wall is where Nintendo lives and where Nintendo of America lives. Like, I, 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 I was thinking about including uh, either the NES Classic Edition or the Super NES Classic Edition as, you know, part of this conversation. Um, and I feel like we're still, like, too close in time to them to, for them really to be considered, like, collector's items. Um, but, like... That when the NES Classic Edition came out, it was a bloodbath. Oh, yeah. There weren't, there weren't enough anywhere. Um, and they were immediately reselling for like for s- so much money, and it's just like it's such a boneheaded move because everyone would and anyone would want it. It was the perfect. I had a uh, when when they came out, it was my plan to like go to. I, I was at a uh, a Target before it opened, and my girlfriend was at a Best Buy, and we were gonna like we were gonna hit a couple different stores and like get as many as we could and give them away as as gifts that Christmas, and. Like, guess what? I got one and she got one. End of list. And we gave that to you, Mark. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, it, it is crazy. Um, I guess. Oh, and I'm glad you brought up the Famicom Detective Club special edition mm-hmm. or like the physical edition that was released in Japan. Someone on our Discord was posting a few images from it. And I totally, uh, you know, that when the games were released on Switch a few years ago, that was the first time I had played the Famicom Detective Club games. Totally fell in love with them. Love the art style of the remakes, but just seeing the work that went into like the art book that was included in the special edition in Japan yeah. for those games was really incredible. The last thing I'll say is Nintendo of America released the QB Box Boy Amiibo in the U.S. Yes. Cowards, do it. How how about better than the Amiibo? How about the games? Because the, that that was only released in Japan, and those games are digital only here. So when the eShop shuts yes. down, you can't get those anymore. Those games are now lost. There's no physical version of them. So I hope they at least bring them to Switch and they do a physical collection of the four games. That would mm-hmm. be great. Then at least we have some preservation. But as it stands, if you don't have a Japanese system, because the 3DS is not region-free, and you don't speak right. Japanese... You now have no way to play that game once those, you know, the eShop goes down, unless you've previously downloaded it, and that's that's a that's the worst way to download games is under duress, where I have to download this now, or I'm never <laughs> playing it again. Uh, that's yes. that's not the way you should be downloading games or, or playing games. You should be enjoying them. You shouldn't be. I have no choice but to. Uh- well, this has been great. I don't think we need to do any more uh, uh, limited or special editions. Uh, we th- This conversation uh, sort of wrapping up the sort of state of things, I think, is uh, the, the best way that we could leave this. Uh, Barry, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this was super fun. Um, is there anything that you would like to plug? Absolutely. Uh, thank you first for having me. Uh, and then uh, if you go to premiumeditiongames.com right now, we have just launched our fourth series of titles that includes Wonderling DX and Rain on Your Parade. Uh, speaking of preservation and keeping things physical, these physical editions will contain all the DX content for Wonderling and Rain on Your Parade also includes the additional paid DLC. So you are getting both copies of these games completely preserved, the entirety of the games. Uh, we have the standard premiums available for $50 with all their bonuses, and then we also have our retros for 70 with even more bonuses. Uh, so these are available now until June 10th. That's when the pre-order closes on these, so make sure to get your orders in uh, as soon as possible. Uh, and we have our third series of titles that we put out previously, Cathedral, Mighty Fight Federation, and Phenotopia Awakening. Those are starting to ship. And we will do a second chance sale for those, as well as Robot Name Fight Deluxe, like I mentioned earlier, uh, Pigeon De- Deluxe as well. Uh, those will happen in June, uh, mid, probably mid-June we'll have those up as available. So premiumeditiongames.com, sign up for our newsletter, follow us on social media, Premium Edition Games, or at Premium Edition 1 on Twitter. Uh, so definitely make sure to check us out. Uh, for Nintendo Fuse, just want to say go to nintendofuse.com, youtube.com slash nintendofuse. Uh, and Nintendo Fuse on social media. We do a bi-weekly podcast, and we have reviews and news and all that stuff up there. And if you just want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at Hawk Hellfire. So I will always love to talk video games and love to talk to you. All right, that is going to do it for this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society. Thanks again to Barry Carenza for joining us for this great conversation. Um, Remember, please rate, review, and follow us on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify or wherever you get podcasts. If you like the episode, please share it on Facebook or Twitter. It helps us out tremendously when you do that. Um, everyone's, everyone's got reach. 
Everyone trusts you. Not everyone trusts you. Some people trust you. Uh, we put enough someones together that becomes everyone trusts you. Recommend the show, please, if you like it. Um, you can follow us on Twitter. I'm at Patrick underscore Ellers. Mark is at MKE Mitchell, and the show is at Cart Society. We also have a Facebook page, which is just Nintendo Cartridge Society. Anthony DeLuca made our logo. Our theme music is provided by 8 You can get more of his music by going to 8 or by listening right now. For my co-host, Mark Mitchell, this is Patrick Eller saying thank you for listening. <laughs>